Hello, Talladega! <laughs> well, that's what my husband did the last time he was on stage. You see, a few weeks ago, we got VIP access as Brian was up on stage enlisting 20 young airmen in front of 164,000 raving NASCAR fans. Um, that opening seemed to work for him, so I thought I'd try it. <laughs> But let's go to the beginning. This is my dad and I, probably my first sail out on Lake Leelanau, a place I loved to sail. I sailed there for many years, and it was enough for me until it wasn't. And then I went on and sailed in college. After college, I went up to Chicago, started working, but never got very far away from a boat, started racing big boats. Had the privilege of winning a couple Chicago Mackinac races. And that opened the door for me as I went out east and started my work on the East Coast. It was fun and an adventure. And then one day I got a phone call. The man that had won the America's Cup in 1992 had decided to defend the America's Cup in 1995 with an all-women's team. This was the opportunity of a lifetime. We made history, and we also inspired women all over the world to try and challenge themselves to do things they never thought possible. It was truly a gift and a wonderful time in my life. Post the America's Cup, I went back to the East Coast, uh, ended up publisher of Yachting Magazine, and had a blast in Manhattan. Then one day I was standing on my balcony and a red, white, and blue airplane flew over my head. It ended up, the pilot was handsome, single, commander of the Thunderbirds, so I married him. <laughs> I was 40 and I was on top of the world. Oh, thank you. Until I wasn't. A mere six weeks later, I found myself crumpled, sobbing in the dirt in front of our house at the Air Force Academy, wrecked because my life was over. Everything I knew was gone, everything that had given me value, that cool job, all my friends, my swanky apartment, my globe trotting, gone. I didn't even have a business card. All I had for my identity was the little plastic card I got in that day, my military ID card, and it categorized me as a dependent spouse. I don't resonate very well with either of those words. <laughs> I was in crisis. It wasn't like I hadn't been through change before. I'd moved 24 times before I married this guy. I'd worked in over two dozen industries, and I'd sailed on over a hundred sailing teams. So change wasn't new, I wasn't afraid of risk. So what was it? This time, it put me in fear. I was completely stopped. My identity was gone. I didn't know what to do. I'm in a completely new military culture. I didn't know the difference between a BX and a commissary. The Alphabet soup of military acronyms was a complete foreign language to me, and I was left wondering, what am I doing? All I had was a dependent spouse ID card as I sat behind a post-9-11 fortified gate and asked myself, who am I? And then it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute. I am passionate about pe helping people navigate change. Well, duh. Change isn't something I'm foreign to. I do it all the time. But I didn't know how to be good at it or good enough to help other people. What skills do you need? What processes out there? Who's good at change? What makes change successful? What makes change fail? I now had a path. I knew I had a mission in front of me. And so, I started learning about change. And I'd like to share a few ideas with you about the process of change. Well, there are some universal truths that happen anytime you're facing change. One, it takes courage. Two, 
there's always a valley, and three, it's worth the effort. Let me take a minute here because for those people that know me, I love a pen and I love my paper. So, if you're in this room, you've achieved something. You may be a high school or college graduate, you may be in a great place in your company, you be, may be happy in your family, but something you've achieved. We'll call this the top of mountain A. The thing is, wherever we are in our life, we know there's something next. We're looking at something we want to do, something we want to change, something maybe that's just fuzzy, but we know it's out there. So we'll call that mountain B. That's out there. The problem here is there is no gondola that goes from the top of mountain A to the top of mountain B. If we want to get here, we have to go down here. And down here can be really scary. Because up here we have a lot of stuff. We have our identity. I had that swanky apartment, that great title. We might have to give up our career. We may have to give up some friends. We may have to move. We may have to give up some hobbies. If we really want to go down here to start something new, that is fear. And fear stops us. And for those people that that is too much for, they won't leave Mountain A. But for those that do and say, this is so compelling, or I need or want to change so much, I'm going to go down here and do the work in the valley. This is where we find the truth of who we are. This is where we find who we need for our next journey. We get perspective on the new world that we want to explore and go into. So let me give you a few examples of what that might look like. This is Taryn. Taryn's awesome. Taryn is on top of the mountain. She's 21, a senior at the Air Force Academy. In fact, we're all on top of the mountain because that picture was taken up in Vail. Uh, her mom and dad are on top of the mountain, too. She's got her arm around her dad. Uh, he's a retired two-star flying for Southwest. Her mom's right behind with a big smile. She's an active-duty one-star, and they're so proud of their daughter. It's awesome. Well, I remember where I was standing on the dock in Chicago four months later when my phone rang. Taryn's plane had gone down. She was in pilot training her second time out, and the instructor had taken their plane into the power lines. The instructor died on impact. Taryn was burned over 80% of her body. Taryn and her parents were now in the valley. Lori and Dave spent four months going down to the burn unit in San Antonio to see Taryn as she fought for her life. But Taryn didn't make it out of the valley. But Lori and Dave had to. They had to for Taryn. They had to for their family. They had to for the Air Force. Most importantly, they had to for themselves. They had to get up every day and put one foot in front of the other. And they did. And Lori's now a three-star, active duty still in the Air Force, honoring Taryn every day in her life. Dave's still flying for Southwest and helping Lori in her skyrocketing career. Sometimes we're not the ones that go down the valley. We get taken down there. But it's who we are down there and what we do that matters. This same kind of model works in our organizations, this, this change dynamic. Um, in 2006, I was still trying to get out of my valley. I'm still learning. I decided if I'm learning, I want to go find, uh, learn from the best in the world. So I found this guy, Tom Patterson. Well, a uh, very um, well-known gentleman named Peter Drucker called Tom the greatest strategic planner that ever lived. So 
here I am at Tom's house in a training session, uh, listening to him tell my fellow student classmate, Kurt Richardson, that in order for Kurt's small company called Otterbox to be successful, <laughs> Kurt was going to have to give up his biggest client. Well, Kurt was on top of the mountain. He had a nice $5 million company. They made little plastic cases for iPods and things. And his biggest client was over a third of his revenue. He had employees to support, overhead. He had uh, suppliers to pay. And here this man was telling him to give up a third of his revenue. T Kurt was terrified. He said, I can't do that. But Kurt trusted Tom. And Kurt took himself and Otterbox down into the valley, and they stayed there, and they did the work. They learned skills, they learned process, they learned to develop feedback, and they built a trust-based culture that fostered innovation and success. Was that trip down the valley worth it for Otterbox? Well, seven years later, they've met, passed the billion dollar mark. Had Kurt not had the courage to go down in the valley and take Otterbox down there and do the work, the story of Otterbox would be very different. There's a good chance Otterbox wouldn't be here today. And this model of change also applies when we want to make big changes in our life, when we are really clear what Mountain B is, we're choosing that change. Uh, I've had the privilege of working in this kind of environment with a lot of elite athletes that are changing their careers, senior military officers going out into the civilian world, and executives who are looking for what's that next big thing I want to do. They're choosing the change. Well, back in 1995, we needed a lot of strength to sail these big sailboats. In fact, most people thought we wouldn't be able to do it, but we did. Um, but in order to get the strength part um, covered, we had to go out and get really strong people. Well, the America's Cup men's teams would actually go out and recruit NFL players and Olympic rowers. Well, back in 1995, there weren't too many professional women linebackers. <laughs> So we went the Olympic rowing route, and we brought in six of these Olympic rowers, extraordinary bios, gold, silver, and bronze medals. They were amazing. These women taught us that we didn't really know what pain was. They, needed to, they knew how to go to the wall and through it, and I have the highest regard. They took me to places I didn't think I could personally go myself. But... They were rowers. So one day I'm in the gym, and our trainer, Dick Dent, walked up to me and said, I need your help. I need you to go out and talk to our rowers. And I said, well, what's up with that? And Dick is not a warm, fuzzy guy. Dick was head trainer for the San Diego Padres for 19 years. This man knows how to take someone broken at the end of the day, fix them up, and get them back on the field the next day. And I needed that. I spent a lot of days with my head in traction, ultrasound, getting massages, ice on every body part, with Dick putting me back together so I could get back on the water the next day. So when he said he was concerned about our rowers, I paid attention. He saw that they were getting near the point of crisis and didn't know why. So I went out and I started asking. We'd become great friends. I said, what's up? They were dying because they were in a place of incompetency. Here they come into our program, the best of the best. They were elite in rowing. They owned the top of Mountain A. And now they're in this athletic high-performance environment. They don't know whether to turn right or left. Starboard and port in our world. I mean, it was excruciating for them. But they did the work. They went through extra coaching sessions. They put in the time. They helped each other. We helped them. And they gained an extraordinary level of competency. And, and this is a key thing when we're moving from A to the next thing, 
they were able to take what they learned in those 10 to 15 years of their high performance rowing career and apply it down here in the valley to learning how to sail. So in six months, not only were they the strength of our team, but they were world-class sailors. Uh, I learned a lot from them in this process. And one thing is that in order to do what they did, you have to get really humble. You have to check your ego at the door because you can't rely on being the best when you don't know anything. And that was a real gift for me because if we try and go down in this valley and we're too proud to find mentors and guides and ask questions, at the least, we're not going to have a very good experience and at the most, we're not going to achieve our goal. So I want to leave you with one last dynamic of change. You may not have chosen change and find yourself there. You may choose change for some goal that you can see. But there's one other reason that to leave the uh, top of the mountain, to leave the top of mountain A, and that is because it's time to leave. And this one is really hard because we have a lot invested here. We've spent our lifetime building our company building our church, building our team, building our nonprofit. But the problem is our organization has now outgrown our skills. We've become the bottleneck and it's time to leave. If we don't, the organization can't grow, but it's hard. People don't want to leave at this point. Can you blame them? Their entire identity is, is summed up in this leadership role they have. They've built this. Their family is invested in their time and energy, talent, resources. They have so much vested here. But if they don't, they're going to inhibit the growth of their organization, the people in the organization, and mostly their own personal growth. It is essential that we find a mountain B so that we can move off mountain A and create the opportunity for others to grow as well as ourselves. So in closing, I want to say whatever kind of change you're going through, the non-chosen one, the chosen one, it's time to leave, it requires courage. Courage to leave the top of the mountain. Courage to go down in the valley. And courage to take the risk to go to Mountain B. So what's next for all of you? Is it something painful or something exciting? I want to promise you that whatever it is, you have what it takes to make the journey. So when it gets scary, leaving the top of mountain A, and the fear starts coming on when you're down in the valley, pause and know that it's good because you're about to start your next extraordinary adventure. Thank you.